Hosea 7. Hosea 7 here this evening. You remember last week, Hosea 6 describes the coming judgment that awaits Israel, and then about a hundred and some years later would also affect Judah. And then we come to chapter 7. And I sat down and I was reading this chapter, and I just read it all the way through. It's 16 verses. And as I was reading, I had the thought, this is a, this chapter is a good example of why people often skip over the minor prophets. Uh, as I was reading, you, you'll see what I'm talking about. You think, you, you'll read a few verses and say, I have no idea what he's talking about. And you read a few more verses and say, I'm even more lost than I was before. And it, it seems to compound the deeper you get into chapter 7. Let me give you just kind of an overview of the chapter, and then we'll, then we'll break it down because it, it does make sense, and it, it does all fit together, but there's some word pictures that are used here. All of the word pictures are used to picture the same thing. So he's going to give multiple illustrations, and from our perspective in 2024 Western culture, we'd say, that's a really weird word picture to use. Why would, why would he choose that? But it, it's cultural, so we'll talk about that. All of the word pictures are describing the wickedness of Israel. So they have judgment coming. That's been the theme since the very beginning. It's been pictured by Gomer and Hosea's relationship. It's been pictured by their children and their names, Jezreel, Loru, Hema, and, and Lo-Ami. They, so there's, there's all of these pictures, and then we come here to chapter 7. In the first portion of chapter 7, Hosea is going to use kitchen illustrations. He's going to talk about baking and ovens and, and such. In verse 11 and 12, he's going to use a bird as the illustration. And then in verses 13 to 16, he's going to liken Israel to a bow, as in bow and arrow. He's going to liken Israel to a, a bent bow. And so we'll talk about that in just a moment. But interspersed throughout these three different word pictures, these three different illustrations that he gives, Hosea is going to reveal the heart of God towards his people. So real quick, go with me here and just let's put it all in its context. Hosea has pictured God as the faithful, loving husband. Israel has been the, the unfaithful, adulterate wife. And God has been reaching out. God has done all that he can to, to bring her back. And every time God brings her back and, and reestablishes the relationship, it doesn't take very long, and she steps out again. And she goes after these other gods. And so there's, this, there's kind of a frustrating element to Hosea. I don't know if you've picked up on it yet. There are 14 chapters of Hosea. We're in the seventh chapter tonight, and it's the same message again and again and again. And if you think it's hard to listen to, imagine how Hosea felt having to give this message to a rebellious people. But let's get started here. First off, he's going to talk about their secret sins in verse 1. He says, when I would have healed Israel, so this is obviously God speaking. Hosea can't heal Israel. God speaking, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. So again, I, God wants to bring them back, and, and they're, he's, he's, he's bringing them up close to him, and oh, they do it again. They, their, their iniquity of Ephraim has discovered the wickedness of Samaria. Ephraim is the most populous tribe, and Samaria is the capital city of Israel. Like when you read about Ahab, wicked king Ahab, he ruled from the city of Samaria. So that's what this is. He's referencing Israel when he talks about Ephraim and Samaria. He says, for they, they commit falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troops of robbers spoil without it's a continuation of the theme of chapter 6. God wants restoration. The people keep frustrating his aims with their sin. Each time God extends his hand to Israel as a husband to an unfaithful wife, rather than, 
Rather than coming to God for forgiveness and restoration, Israel doubles down in, in sin. And it, it almost seems like something else is uncovered. It's, it's not just, well, it's idolatry. No, it's something else. We've already talked about the priests. You remember the priests. The priests were out there and they were actually encouraging people to sin because then they would get richer by the offerings that people would offer after they'd sin. And so every time Hosea opens his mouth and, and he's talking about how God wants them to come back, ah, there, here comes something new down the pike. That's what's going on. Do you think it'd be 100% when there would have been bodies of people? There would have been remnants of people. It's not everyone. There were, I mean, Hosea is among them. There were, And there were other pockets of individuals. But this is, when you talk about the public, They've gone, they've gone south, for sure. What he's saying here in verse 1 is that there's really no safe space within Israel. And I'm not talking about the woke safe spaces that we hear about now. I'm talking, there, there was not a place where you could go where you were safe. Israel had devolved as a society. The culture was such that there wasn't a safe place. He talks about the, the thief cometh in, so there are thieves who get into your house, and there are roving bands of robbers in the street. Where do you go? You, you can't go into the hills, because there's, there's people out there who have nefarious intent. If you go home, the likelihood of you having a break-in is very, very high. If you go out into the street, you're just in as much danger. <clears throat> Verse 2, they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness, this is, this is God speaking about Israel. They don't remember that I remember. I remember their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. In all of her wickedness, Israel had de devolved as a society. They had, they had become so blinded, so insensitive to sin, so desensitized to sin that they were involving themselves in debauchery and, and just all kinds of wickedness. And they had the idea that God wasn't catching it. You say, how could that possibly happen? Well, look around. <laughs> look around. And, and if we want to get really personal, look in the mirror. Because we do this too. We, we kind of, we, we have this thought, well, <laughs> I... God, God might have missed that. I think I, I think I got away with it. No, you didn't get away with it. God knows all things. He says, I remember all their wickedness. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. But God does see the evil. In warning his disciples about hypocrisy, in Luke 12, 2, Jesus said, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. It's not a secret from God. So it says God cannot look on sin. He's got the world, but it can't be involved in sin. Yes, God cannot. Evil cannot dwell in the presence of God is what it would mean. Think of a king sitting on his throne. He cannot look upon sin, meaning it doesn't get to hang out in his presence. Yeah. But obviously God yeah. beholds right. sin. But it, it, cannot, it, it cannot coexist in the right. same way. Same. Right? Well, well, but if you think about it, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, one of the sayings from the cross was, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God the Father turn his back on the Son? Because he was bearing my sin. And so that... So God can look at me because I'm robed in the righteousness of his son. That's, that's the, the tremendous <laughs> blessing of it. But, but at the same time, my sin now, as a believer, my sin does not go unnoticed. My sin prohibits fellowship. It breaks, it, it hinders my, my relationship with my heavenly father. It doesn't make me not his child, but it does... It does make it difficult. It, it, it hinders my relationship. Yes? Pastor, when you say that, okay, the Bible says that our sins are going to be shouted from the housetops or whatever you just said, what is the nature of that 
in respect to each other. How you know, I don't understand what what that means. Like are we gonna be like, oh Mark did this and Connie did that? Like, what do you know? <laughs> 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 you know? No. no. So, <laughs> I noticed she did use Mark you as both examples. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In other words, she knows stuff that you, the people, don't know. <laughs> no, I do not. Yeah. I just, yeah. Anyway, so explain that to me. It, it's not that we will be tasked with, with broadcasting the faults of others. It's, it's a general principle. That is, it, what, what Jesus is saying there is that what, what we consider to be private, what we consider to be private sin, won't stay private. It, it, it has a way of coming out. If you pair this with the verse that, that is, is given in Numbers where Moses told the children of Israel, be sure your sin will find you out. And when it does, it has a way of being public. You remember Achan in, in Joshua chapter 7? He had this private sin that he hid under his tent. And then it ended up coming out. Everybody knows about it. Everybody stoned he and his family to death as a result of it. So it's it's... A testament to the nature of sin that when it comes out, and it will, it will be public. So, so what do we do? Well, we confess, we forsake, we seek forgiveness. That's, that's the, the way to avoid that right there, is, is to confess, to confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So what you're saying is, is that when we confess our sins, those sins are not going to be made private? I mean, public? Like that verse talks about? It, it would, it, if, if there's a sin that, when it comes to confession of sin, the scope of, the scope of the sin is the scope of the confession. If I have an argument with my wife, which never happens. But if I, look, just wild out there. If I was to have an argument with my wife, is it going to be broadcast? Would I need to come into church and, and get here before you all and say, I have something to confess to all of you as my brother, sister, and Christ, Steph, Steph and I had an argument this. No. Who do I need to apologize to? I need to apologize to the Lord, and I need to apologize to my wife. Right? Because that's the scope of the sin. Maybe I need to apologize to my kids. I, I need, to, I need to, to deal with everybody who's in the circle. And if the circle is big, then I need to confess big. I need to seek the forgiveness of those who have been hurt by my sin. But again, that's, you, you can take that and, and some people go, you know, they're, they end up coming up and they're confessing something. I didn't know that you did that. I didn't have any concept that that was going on. Not really necessary. The scope of the sin should be the scope of the confession as well. And that, when, when we deal with sin, God's way, then he says that I will cast their sins into the depths of the sea. I'll remove them as far as the east is from the west. So those, those sins are, are gone. So in other words, it's only, it's only the unconfessed sins that can be made public? Unconfessed sins, yeah, that, that, will, that will, become, will become an issue. Yeah? Another verse, Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Let me, let's, let's put it in perspective. As I was reading, I came across this quote. I've come across it again, and, and I don't know where it originated. But it's a good reminder that secret sin on earth is open scandal. Think, think about that for just a minute. Secret sin on earth. What I think, oh, I've got, this, this, is, this is just me. In heaven, it would be the equivalent of it's happening on the jumbotron. It's, you know, it's, it's open scandal. I'm not getting away with it. It's, it's public in that setting. A good reminder as we look here. Israel, here in verse 1 and 2, they think they're getting away with all of this. They think that they've, they're skating on this, and, and God's turned his, his blind eye to them, but, but God is keenly and intimately aware of every detail of their sin. They're not getting away with anything. Where did, where did a priest come from you just said? 
I'm not sure where it originated. Right. Okay. Yeah, I've heard it. I've heard it many times over the years, but I found it in it's in a book called Minor, the Minor Prophets by Charles Feinberg. But he attributed it to someone well, else. As far as east and west come in, where that comes. Our sin is this is sin that's, that's not confessed. Oh. This is sin that, that is yeah. Because when we do when we confess our sin, the sin is the sin is done away with. Yeah. But the trouble is, is that Israel's not confessing anything. They don't think they need to because they don't think God sees. God says, oh, no, I, I see. <laughs> Have you ever, you ever walk in on, especially when, when kids are toddlers, and you walk in and they have chocolate all over their face, and you say, were you eating the cookies? No. You say, <laughs> Come on, if maybe you were even watching them do it, that, you know, they were hiding behind the couch and they didn't know that, they're, you know, that you could see them and they're sitting there stuffed in their face and they've got cookies all over their face and crumbs all over the front. You say, were you eating cookies? No, no. That's, that's how blatantly obvious the sin of Israel and ours is to the Lord. Verse 3. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. So we had the priests a while back. We had the phrase, light people, light priests. Now we've got the rulers as well, which we've dealt with them a little bit. But the rulers of Israel at all levels, the king and the princes, they're not looking the other way when it came to the wickedness of the people either. They're actually encouraging it too. So you have the priests on the religious front. They're, hey, no, go ahead. Do whatever you want. You've got the leaders, the, the political leaders. Hey, no, do whatever you want. Proverbs 29, 2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear it, rule, the people mourn. There's all kinds of application there that we could draw. So now we come to kind of the, the first of the, the weird pictures, at least from our, our perspective. Verse 4, we're going to talk about the oven of lust. Verse 4, they are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker. Who ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. That is a strange phrase. We would not use that phrase today. But again, culturally, everyone was aware of this. Everyone, because back then you didn't go to Walmart and buy your bread off the shelf. You went to the bakery if you didn't have the oven yourself and you were doing it in your own home. Everyone knew what it was to walk in because they, they had been there that morning. They would buy bread daily, and so everyone knew exactly what he's talking about as he's talking about how the lust, the immoral behavior of Israel is constantly simmering. It's constantly, you think about the, the fire uh, of in, in a baker's oven. How often does it completely go out? Well, never if he can help it. He, he would scoop out some of the coals even when he was cleaning, and then he would immediately put coals in there to keep the oven hot so that he can keep things going. And that's exactly how Israel's immorality was. It was constantly burning. Sometimes it was big. Sometimes it was just a low glow, but it's always going on. He says they are all there, that first three words, meaning everybody's involved. The priests political leaders, the kings, the princes, all the common people. Just as a baker would stoke the fire in his oven and then go back to the kneading of the dough, expecting the fire to be hot when, he, when the dough was risen, the sin of Israel is always smoldering. And it also has the idea that Israel didn't have to warm up to the idea of immorality and idolatry. <laughs> They're always ready to do it. It didn't take much temptation to get them to go over the edge. They're always there because it's always simmering. Verse 5. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners. What he's talking about is the, the king. Likely in this day, this would be Pekah, the king of Israel, the last king of Israel, He'd made a fool of himself in the day of our king, perhaps his birthday or some other special day to the king, maybe coronation day. But on this special day, the leaders of Israel had publicly humiliated themselves by becoming drunk and playing the fool. The 
this is what was going on among the respected higher classes of Israel, what do you suppose was going on with the common people? If the, if the king, who you think of as being, he's, he should be the, the example, if he's walking around in a drunken stupor, what do you, what do you think just the average person is doing? It's a, it's a testament to everything in Israel. Verse 6. For they have made ready their heart like an oven. Again, back to the, that illustration. Whilst they lay in wait, their baker sleepeth all the night. In the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. What do you do at night? If you've ever heated with wood, what do you do at night when you get ready to go to bed? You stoke the fire, right? You put, in enough, you put in enough wood so that it, when you get up in the morning, if you did it right... You don't go in there and, and you're able to stick your hand in and drag the ashes out. If you did it right, you've got a, a kind of a, a bed of, of red coals that are still keeping everything hot. That's exactly how Israel was. They, they would stoke up their immorality. This doesn't happen today, does it? It happens all the time. It happens everywhere. Verse, verse 7 they are all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There's none among them that calleth unto me. The debauchery of the kings of Israel had come back upon them and devoured them. All of Israel's kings were wicked. I've mentioned this several times over the course of this study. Of the last six kings of Israel, of the last six kings of Israel... Five were assassinated. Does that tell you anything about the political picture? The, the societal stability? Some of you remember when Kennedy was shot. He's the last successful assassination of an American president. You maybe remember when, when they tried against Reagan. But it's a big deal when your leader, when the leader of America was shot and, and died. It's, man, it, it rocks people's world. Five out of six. Three out of the kings who were alive during the days of Hosea were assassinated. So that's the, the societal picture. That's how the culture is. Even in the national chaos and disorder that would ensue following the violent death of her leaders, no one stopped and looked to God. Now, I obviously was not there when Kennedy got shot, but I have read enough about it, and I've looked at the news articles and such. When Kennedy got shot, there were people who were praying, kind of like after 9-11. After Why? Well, because it's a big, it kind of sets you back on your heels a little bit. People are praying, people are crying. Well, nobody did that in Israel, and it happened five times in, almost in a row. Why? Well, because they're so busy with their immorality. They had so much sin going on, they didn't stop. Even as their leaders are dying to say, maybe God's trying to get our attention. Look at verse 8. When it came to the loss of their leaders, rather than look to heaven, they just put their head down and they partied harder. <laughs> That's, do you think that would happen in the United States today? As I'm reading this, I'm kind of... <laughs> I'm, it's, it's hard not to put it up against our country. If, if something happened in America right now, I, I remember back September 11th, I was living in Pennsylvania. The, the Flight 91 went down in one of my teacher's fields. I, I was very closely associated with it, knew what was going on. And it, man, folks were, they, they were looking to the Lord. Churches were full, everything. It was, it was different. But I don't know what would happen today. I could see it being a lot more like this than it was even back then. I could see a lot more. Well, let's just let's just party a little harder. Lots of that lots of parallels. What's that? That didn't last very long. No, it didn't. No, the church is emptied out pretty quick. Look at verse eight. There was a mixing rather than a separation. Verse eight. Ephraim again. This is Israel. Ephraim. He hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. We'll, de we'll deal with a cake not turned in a moment. That's a strange insult to throw at somebody. But what lengths had God gone to to ensure that his chosen people maintained separation? 
What lengths had he gone to? Well, when they went down to Egypt, he put them in Goshen so they wouldn't mix with the Egyptians. He had commanded them when they came out of Egypt and went into Canaan, he commanded them to utterly destroy the people of the land. Why? So they won't intermarry. Again and again, God forbade mixed marriages and alliances between his people and the pagans around them. But Israel, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, had gone directly against God's orders and they had mixed in with the people. Oh, after all, why not? We can marry their daughters and they can marry our sons and we can have good trade relations. It, it's just, it's good for everybody all the way around. What does it mean that they are a cake not turned? That's, maybe you've heard somebody, I, I have heard the expression not so much uh, where I grew up in the Northeast, but when somebody would tell you, I don't think their biscuit's done in the middle. You ever, you ever heard that expression? What does that mean? Well, it means they're a little soft in the head is how we would use that term. Take that and take it away from the personal aspect. The cake mentioned here, again, everybody was familiar with the, this, this expression. The cake here would be the equivalent of our pancake. So it would be dough that would be poured onto, a lot of times, just a really, really hot rock. And then it would be watched. What's, what's the most important part of cooking a pancake? Turning it over at the right time, right? You have to get it, you have to get it about halfway done. And then you flip it over and you do about that same length of time on, on the other side. What happens if you say, oh, I'm just going to, I don't really want to flip the pancake. What do you think? It's going to be burnt on the bottom and it's going to be raw on the top. That's what he's saying here. Israel is a cake not turned. <clears throat> if in Israel they had the the outside performance, so let's talk about the, the bottom that's overdone. They had the outside performance of religion under control. You remember we talked about a couple weeks ago, when they found themselves in trouble, what was their first instinct? We'll just, we'll just make big sacrifices. We'll just offer more sheep, and that'll fix everything. So they had the, the outside religious observance... But on the inside, they were completely indifferent to the demands of God. So they're burned, they're overdone on one side, and they're raw on the other. One commentator said it this way. He said, it's easy for us to become like a cake unturned. We may have much of doctrine and little of deed, much of creed and little of conduct, much of belief and little of behavior, much of principle and little of practice, much of orthodoxy, and little of orthopraxy. In other words, it's easy for us to have it all right here, but not actually do it. And in so doing, we're like a cake unturned. Verse 9. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, his gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. In all of this, in everything that we're looking at, Israel was blind to their sin. That their strength was devoured, it was depleted, but they still thought, ah, I'm as good as ever. That doesn't end well. Why do they make some athletes retire at a certain point? Well, because if they go out there, they're going to get hurt. They don't even realize how far gone they are. Because sense, or sin makes us senseless. Israel is likened to a man who's aging rapidly, but he doesn't realize it, and he tries to keep going, and as a result of this, he makes a fool of himself. He's, he's not there, but he doesn't realize it. Everybody else realizes it. You remember when Delilah cut Samson's hair? And she told him, the Philistines be upon thee. And he stood up and he thought, well, I'll go, I'll go out and I'll shake myself as at other times and I'll scare them off. And that verse in Judges 16, 20 says, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He thought it would be just like it was last time. 
But it wasn't, because God wasn't there. It wasn't, it wasn't Samson's hair. What was it? It was Samson's God. The hair was symbolic of a relationship with God. When he had that off, he, he had expressly broken the covenant of his own free will. This is what happened to Israel. And can this happen to us as well? Can we become spiritually depleted and not even realize it? Because we're so tied up in the moment, we think oh, everything's how it always is. And we don't realize that we're, according to another verse in the New Testament, that we're poor and wretched and blind and naked. Verse 10. The pride of Israel testifieth to his face. They do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. For everything that he's just said, all that he's just said, verses 1 through 9, they still don't seek the Lord. They, they don't get it. This, the national disgrace, the assassin, assassination of her kings, the trouble and the chastening of God, and Israel still didn't get it. So he likens them to another phrase that we probably wouldn't throw around a whole lot. Verse 11, Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. In the Middle East, the dove is considered to be one of the most stupid animals. It's, it's not obvious that you've heard the phrase bird brain. <laughs> Doves are not known for their miraculous intelligence. Israel could see that trouble was on the horizon. They didn't, they didn't put two and two together that, hey, we've sinned and God's judgment's coming upon us. They didn't do that, but they could tell, hey, things are kind of iffy on the national stage. And in an effort to protect herself and keep political power, Israel was, was courting the favor of two different people, two different people groups, two different nations. They were courting Assyria, which would be in the north and over to the west, or to, over to the east, and they were courting Egypt, which would be to the south, uh, the <coughs> south uh, west. So th they're courting Assyria and Egypt, and they're, they're kind of going between these, kind of like a dove. Egypt and Assyria are not allies of Israel. They never have been. They're not today. But since she refused to turn to God, she's looking for help in all the wrong places. In just a couple of decades from this prophecy, Assyria would come in and would, would take into captivity the nation of Israel. But God is not going to sit idly by and allow Israel to, to spiritually whore herself out to the nation surrounding her. He's watching. Verse 12, when they shall go, again, they're like a dove that's just flitting around from place to place. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. God's going to bring them down. They're not going to get away with it. God loves Israel too much to allow her to get away with this. Payday. Is coming. Hebrews 12 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Let's look at verse 13. Kind of, this kind of brings it all back to us, brings it all together. God has this relentless love for Israel. Israel has a profound disdain for God, and so God says, Whoa. <laughs> Unto them. Whenever you read those words, especially when they're coming out of the mouth of God, you should, <laughs> you should perk your ears up. Why is God pronouncing a woe upon his people? He says, woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Why does God chasten? Why does God punish? Same reason that a parent does. Proverbs 3.11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. I read you Proverbs, or Hebrews 12.6 a moment ago. Listen to Hebrews 12.7. If ye endure chastening, this is written to believers, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. 
For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they for a few days verily chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Why does God chasten us? That we might be partakers of his holiness. God loves me too much to let me get away with it. God loves you too much to let you get away with it. Hebrews 12, 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. How many of you got that, that statement given to you when you were little? This hurts me more than this hurts you. Yeah, I heard it. I've even said it now. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God's chastening is one of the signs that we are his children. Israel refused to recognize God or his chastening. Rather, rather than recognize him, they lied about him. Imagine God, the faithful husband, reaching out to, to his unfaithful wife who has spit in his face constantly. And rather than, rather than come back, she goes out and tells lies about him. She goes out and drags his, his reputation through the mud. Verse 14, they have not cried unto me with their heart. When they howled upon their beds, they assembled themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. To the outside observer, Israel might look as if she was repenting. She's crying on the bed, but she only cried because she'd been caught. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's, she's crying because life's tough. <laughs> the way of the transgressor is hard, as we've looked at. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. That's, that's what we're seeing here. This is the sorrow of the world. They're, they're, having, they're, they're crying because life's tough, not because, not because they spit in the face of their loving God. When they would... When they should be calling a, co a solemn assembly to repent and seek God's face, they call a potluck to encourage one another that, hey, it's going to get better soon. It has to get better. It's not going to get better. Verse 15, though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. Israel had an impressive resume of victories, all made possible by God's enabling, and they refused to recognize any of them. They had the idea, yeah, we're pretty tough. We're pretty amazing. We, we win most of the time. Why did they win? Well, because God, God tipped the scales for them. They didn't acknowledge that. The last verse, verse 16. They return, but not to the most high. We could, we could spend a long time, could preach a whole message on that phrase alone. They return, but not to the to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. In her hour of trouble and need, Israel would look anywhere but the one place they should have looked. They're like a crooked bow. Or think about it, a bow that gets twisted. A bent bow. I, had, I was out and target practicing with my bow during deer season. And I was shooting, and my shots were doing all sorts of weird things. And I, I moved my bow, and I realized that the bolts that were holding the sight on my bow had worked their way loose, and my, my sight was all, all wobbly. So I was not getting consistent shots because my sights were off. That's what Israel is. They're a bent bow. The sights are off, so all her shots go wide. In verse 11, they were calling on Egypt to help them. But when Israel would fall to the Assyrians, the people of Egypt would smirk. <laughs> yeah, they, those Israelites talk awful big, but when it came right down to it, they went out with a whimper. 
Paul references the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. He says, now all these things happened unto them, friends, samples, and they are written for our admonition. Like I said, this, this chapter is different. <laughs> it's different even than what we've looked at in the first six chapters of Hosea. This is one of those that we think, oh, I don't know, why is he talking about bread and ovens and birds and all? I want. For our admonition, these things are written. Israel thought they were getting away with secret sin. But secret sin does not exist. God knows. God knows all. Israel was hypocritical. They were like a pancake that hadn't been turned. They knew how to offer sacrifices and put on a spiritual show. But in reality, they were engaged in filthy spiritual fornication. They were blinded by their sin. And they didn't realize the toll it had taken and the actual condition they were in. Israel is, they're, they're like a, an 85-year-old man who insists that he can go out in the boxing ring against a heavyweight. See, no, you're going to die. No, I got it. That's what Israel's doing. No, I got this. I don't, I don't need, no, you're, you're going to die. You're going to get, you're going to get beat into the mat. That's what's going to happen to Israel. They were miserable and they cried themselves to sleep at night, but they adamantly refused to turn back to the Lord. Rather, they sought solace in the words of their friends. They were looking for somebody who would come pat them on the back and say, hey, it's going to be all right. It's not going to be all right. I said earlier, it's easy for us to tire of the message of the prophets because it's judgment, judgment. Just imagine again how hard it was for Hosea to be the one preaching it to the kingdom of Israel in their latter days. Israel hardened her heart. They refused to amend their ways. So the question is, will we learn from her experience? Or do we have to go down the same destructive path? Because, again, to varying degrees, all of us can do this, and all of us, if we're honest, we have done this at some time in, in, in the past, where we thought, no, I'm getting away with it. No, you're not. We, we feel like, no, I've, I've got this. I can, I can handle this in my own strength. No, you can't. Will you learn the lessons from Israel, or will you have to learn yourself? These things are written so that we can learn from Israel's experience. That would be the wise choice.